Good morning. My name is Michelle, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Shopify Q3 2018 earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. I would now like to turn the call over to Katie Keda, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone. We are glad you can join us for Shopify's third quarter 2018 conference call. We are joined this morning by Toby Lutke, Shopify CEO, Harley Finkelstein, our Chief Operating Officer, and Amy Shapiro, our CFO. After prepared remarks, we will open it up for your questions. We will make forward-looking statements on our call today that are based on assumptions and therefore subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected. We undertake no obligation to update these statements except as required by law. You can read about these risks and uncertainties in our press release this morning, as well as in our filings with U.S. and Canadian regulators. Also, our commentary today will include adjusted financial measures, which are non-GAAP measures. These should be considered as a supplement to and not as a substitute for GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations between the two can be found in our earnings press release, which is available on our website. Finally, note that because we report in U.S. dollars, all amounts discussed today are in U.S. dollars unless otherwise indicated. With that, I turn the call over to Harley. Thanks, Katie, and good morning, everyone. We had another great quarter at Shopify, delivering strong results and advancing key initiatives. In particular, we shipped several exciting features ahead of the busiest selling period for our merchants, Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Our progress over the last few months spanned our priority areas of investment, that is, across platform, Shopify Plus, and international. I'll walk through key accomplishments in each of these areas, starting with our platform. As we previewed at the Unite Conference, our product teams are focused on shipping features that help merchants sell more and let them work more efficiently while making the most of our partner ecosystem. We shipped several of these features in the past few months, including multi-location inventory, our new app store, as well as our marketing dashboard. All of these are now contributing to the incredible value already delivered to our merchants on the Shopify platform. While a few weeks in, it's not enough to realize the full benefits we are expecting from these enhancements, we are already seeing signs of success. For instance, since the launch of our new App Store in early September, we have already seen a meaningful increase in conversion rates for app installations following a search. We are also developing features that add value at the point of transaction, which means our revenue from these merchants grows alongside GMV. One feature that launched earlier this month is Fraud Protect. For a small fee, Fraud Protect shields merchants from fraudulent chargebacks on protected orders, allowing merchants to accept and fulfill more orders with confidence. We extended our far-reaching support for merchants even further two weeks ago when we opened our first physical retail space in Los Angeles. Within 24 hours of opening for bookings, hundreds of sessions and appointments with Shopify gurus were scheduled, and several of the opening workshops filled up completely. It's exciting for us to offer merchants and aspiring entrepreneurs a space where they can find support, inspiration, and education. Our new space and all our new features we rolled out are geared towards making commerce better for everyone. To help achieve this goal, we will continue to make platform investments on the following key themes. Reducing complexity, simplifying workflows, and helping merchants build the right capabilities to run their businesses. Moving on to Shopify Plus, which completed another fantastic quarter. Hundreds of high-growth merchants continued to join Shopify Plus leading up to the busy holiday season. We attracted these merchants with the flexibility and reliability of our platform, which can manage the stress of high sales volumes and capture all the upside that comes with it. Shopify Plus continues to welcome more well-recognized brands representing diverse industries, including home furnishing, fashion and beauty, and food and beverage companies. These include some of the largest Canadian furniture stores, like The Brick and Leon's Furniture, as well as DJ Khaled's luxury furniture line, new stores from fashion designers such as Victoria Beckham and Rachel Roy, my personal underwear brand of choice, Tommy John, Belgian chocolatier Godiva, the Bulletproof Coffee brand, and meal replacement company Soylent. Shopify Plus continues to add even more brands from the consumer packaged good companies like Unilever. In October, Shopify Plus entered new retail territory in Canada, 
when cannabis was legalized here on October 17th. While we don't normally call out specific verticals, we have been fielding several questions about this one, given how new it is and the fact that it is a highly regulated industry. We've actually already been the platform of choice for licensed producers of medical cannabis in Canada for years. So with the legalization of cannabis for recreational use, Shopify was a natural fit. We are now powering recreational cannabis sales for the largest Canadian provincial governments, as well as the leading licensed producers and private retailers. These retailers recognize that Shopify's technology is uniquely positioned to help them adapt to the demands of regulators and fulfill key requirements. We are proud of what we've been able to accomplish in a tight period of time, given the complexities in introducing a new and regulated industry. Turning to international, we are taking a deliberate approach in our expansion efforts, building trust with merchants in our new markets, and honing our product market fit. Seven of the 10 largest e-commerce markets globally are in non-English speaking countries, which makes it incredibly important to localize our platform in each region we decide to enter. While it is still early, momentum is building in our priority international regions. Our mix of international merchants relative to total new merchant ads reached its highest level this year. Additionally, our international merchants continue to expand their contribution to total GMV on our platform. A great example of localization is the launch of Shopify payments in Germany last month. This is special, not just because Germany is the largest economy in the Eurozone, but also because it marks our first local payment method for Shopify payments, allowing for bank transfers in addition to credit card payments. This is notable since it's estimated that by 2021, most online transactions won't even use a credit card. Moving on to partners. Throughout our journey, our partners have played a critical role in the success of our merchants and the success of Shopify. Our partner ecosystem remains strong, with more than 16,500 partners having referred merchants to Shopify in the past 12 months alone. Currently, there are more than 2,200 apps available to merchants on our platform, which is a smaller number relative to last quarter, as not all existing apps were approved to transition over to the new App Store. We continue to work with our partners to deliver the right capabilities to our merchants so they have the tools they need to succeed. As we head towards the home stretch into the busiest selling season of the year, we are ready to help our merchants every step of the way. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Amy. Thanks, Harley, and good morning, everyone. This was another strong quarter for Shopify. We grew revenue 58% year over year to $270.1 million, with healthy performance from both subscription solutions and merchant solutions. Subscription solutions revenue grew 46% compared with Q3 2017 to $120.5 million, driven by growth in monthly recurring revenue of 41% to $37.9 million, primarily driven by merchant ads. Shopify Plus continued to increase its contribution to monthly recurring revenue, accounting for $9.2 million, or 24%, compared with 20% of MRR in Q3 of 2017. Another item of note is the expansion of revenue within subscription solutions that is not MRR. Faster growth of revenue from apps relative to MRR is one driver. Another is the incremental revenue from platform fees for Shopify Plus as the pricing structure change for Shopify Plus that we introduced early last year gradually rolls in with contract renewals. Platform fee revenue is directly correlated with the GMV growth that Shopify Plus merchants are driving, and that growth has been quite healthy. As a result, and with more merchants rolling into the revised pricing structure, this component of revenue more than tripled over last year. It is important to note that this greater value we are now retaining from Shopify Plus is not counted in MRR, as this portion of the Shopify Plus subscription revenue is not necessarily recurring. Merchant Solutions revenue grew 68% to $149.5 million, on pace with last quarter's growth. This growth was driven by GMV expansion, which increased 55% year over year to $10 billion, as well as by the continued penetration of Shopify payments, shipping, and capital. GMV reached a new high this quarter, exceeding that of Q4 2017, our strongest quarter last year. $4.1 billion of GMV was processed on Shopify payments, an increase of 71% versus the comparable quarter last year. 
the amount of GMV processed on Shopify payments ticked up to a record high 41% penetration, with Shopify Plus continuing to increase its share of GPV. Capital and shipping, both higher margin solutions, grew revenue over 100% from last year. Gross profit dollars grew 50% from Q3 of 2017 to $149.7 million. As we mentioned in July, our transition to a third-party cloud platform was completed in the third quarter. With the subscription solutions gross margin headwinds of cost duplication and server depreciation now behind us, we can begin to look for ways to optimize costs on our cloud platform, which as we have said are expected to be higher than running our own cloud. While Merchant Solutions gross margin improved year over year, it was down slightly sequentially due to greater mix of Shopify payments versus Q2. This larger mix was driven in part by the growing adoption of Shopify payments by Shopify Plus merchants. Of course, the upside has been continued expansion of GMV take rates, driving gross margin dollar growth, and enhancing our value add to Shopify Plus merchants, which is a trade-off we're happy with. Our adjusted operating loss in Q3 was approximately $3.6 million, or 1.3% of revenue, compared with income of $1.7 million, or 1% of revenue, in the third quarter of 2017. Adjusted net income for the quarter was $4.5 million, or $0.04 cents per share. This compares with $5 million, or $0.05 cents per share, for last year's third quarter. Our cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities balance was $1.6 billion, consistent with our June 30 balance. Cash flow from operations was only slightly positive in the quarter as we continue to see strong demand from our merchants for Shopify Capital, which, as you know, is funded from our own balance sheet with a mechanism in place to ensure the majority of advances outstanding. Merchants can thrive on Shopify in ways that aren't possible through single channels or single point solutions providers. That we make it possible for virtually anyone in the world to easily start selling is only the first of many layers of value. The much harder work of marketing, customer order and inventory management, transaction processing in multiple currency and payments methods, shipping and financing is where we focus most of our efforts and investments. These efforts pay off. Within two weeks of our launch of Shopify payments in Germany last month that Harley mentioned, percentage adoption by our merchants there was already solidly in the double digits. Moreover, most of the merchants who adopted Shopify payments in Germany already had a transaction process on the local payments method. While the full benefit of our investments will materialize over the years ahead, this is a great early indicator that being targeted and sequenced with localization is the right approach to take. Given our better than expected performance in the quarter, we are raising our expectations for the full year and now expect to grow revenue at over 55% to between $1 billion $45 million and $1 billion $55 million and to achieve adjusted operating income of $8 to $10 million. For the fourth quarter, we expect revenue of 315 to 325 million dollars and adjusted operating income between 16 and 18 million dollars. Stock-based compensation in 2018 is now expected to be approximately 105 million dollars for the full year with about 30 million dollars of this in the fourth quarter. The continued growth of our merchant base from entrepreneurs to larger brands and our ongoing expansion of wallet share prove the strength of our platform and the value we add to businesses as we continue to simplify commerce, expand our capabilities, and broaden our reach, we are confident in our growth trajectory and our position as a leading commerce platform. With that, I will hand the call back to Katie. Thank you, Amy. All right, um, we would like to uh, turn the call over to you for your questions. Before we do, I would like to remind everyone to please limit themselves to just one question so everyone can have a chance to ask a question on the call today. Michelle, can we have our first question, please? Certainly. Your first question comes from Brad Zelnick from Credit Suisse. Your line is open. 
Excellent. Nice quarter, guys. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about Shopify Plus. You have a number of fantastic large merchants, many of which you, you named in your prepared remarks, and Plus continues to grow its contribution to the business. But the higher end of the market is also very competitive. Can you talk a bit about pricing at the high end as you negotiate and renegotiate with these merchants, and as well as the stickiness at, at the higher end as well? Thanks. Hey, Brad, it's Harley. I'll take that, that first question. Uh, so, for, first of all, I think if you look at the, the ratio of, of price to value of, of Shopify Plus, certainly it still falls on the side of value. Um, part of that is intentional because we want to. We, we believe that there's a lot of opportunity for us in the mid-market, especially, but also at the at the higher end of the market as well. One of the nice parts about Shopify Plus is that it's it's easy to start on Shopify Plus, but once you once you start once you become a merchant, um, the product is actually quite sticky, particularly with things like Shopify Flow, which allows you to automate workflows more and more. You spend your time in the Shopify Plus dashboard, and so the product itself is is quite sticky. From a competitive perspective, uh, again, I think for the foreseeable future, we're quite happy with our pricing. Um, we, we changed the pricing last year. This way we can share in the upside if, if merchants sell a ton and we're able to, to also uh, share in that upside and, 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 and take a larger piece of wallet. Uh, but that being said, we are constantly reevaluating whether our pricing makes sense and, and it may change over time, but we're quite happy with the success and the progress of Plus today. Great. Fantastic. Thanks, Harley. Your next question comes from Colin Sebastian from Baird. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Um, if you look at ML, MRR, excluding perhaps the, the nice mix of plus and, and the platform fees, um, just hoping for a little more color on, on the pace of growth of the net new subscriber ads and, and where you'd expect that growth uh, to, to trend over the next uh, few quarters or years. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, you know, we, uh, we did see a, a slight uptick um, a slightly higher uh, merchants added in the third quarter versus the, the second quarter. Um, one thing that I, I want to point out, um, if you're looking at net new MRR in the quarter, we did have a slight headwind there and a pricing change that we made, uh, that we had announced it at Unite uh, around our point of, of sale product. Uh, we had been charging for uh, that $49 a month, and uh, we've now eliminated that, and that's included in the $79 and above uh, pricing plans. Um, so as you're as you're doing your your math, uh, consider that. Um, you know, with respect to merchant ads in the future and MRR growth generally, um, you know, we're we're happy with our performance in the quarter. We exceeded our expectations, as our our guidance implied. Uh, for merchant growth, MRR growth, and overall growth. Um, you know, we, we want to steer you towards the robustness of our business model overall. Uh, we have two primary growth levers that uh, we can pull from, subscriptions, which is mostly captured by MRR and GMB. Um, our focus is on long-term growth for our overall business model using these levers. And our investments pay off in different ways over different time horizons. Last year, two of our key investment areas were, were growth by widening the funnel of merchants and plus. And we're seeing the payoff of those investments now in continued strong GMV growth. Uh, in the quarter, GMV per merchant continued to increase year over year and quarter over quarter. And overall, GMV growth was sequentially strong. This year, our primary investment area is international, uh, which we expect has a payoff over the next several years. So we're quite confident uh, about the size of our TAM um, and the runway for growth that these investments and others provide well into the future for both merchants, uh, NMRR, and, and also GMV. Very helpful. Thank you. The next question will come from Ken Wong from Guggenheim Securities. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Harley, you touched on you touched on the cannabis market uh, a little earlier, um, and I know you guys have had some experience with this in the past. But it's, you know, kind of the, the the retail side of things is a, is a new opportunity. Can you give us a sense for kind of how much um, you know how, how much you guys have baked into Q4, and and, and maybe just some if, if there's any kind of seasonal trends that we should be thinking about in terms of uh, how that market might might scale up. 
Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, look, it, it's, it's a brand new industry, it's a brand new market. Uh, certainly, we've, we've been working with the medical uh, providers of cannabis in Canada for a while now, and I think what we have is a really good product, which allows for uh, regulated industries, uh, which, you know, they require things like nimbleness because regu um, compliance with laws are always changing. And I think we've actually created a product that is kind of ideal for these sort of industries, which is why we were so happy to get selected uh, by these very large provinces. We won't comment on specific merchants, uh, as, we, as we never do, but we will say that in terms of uh, the revenue from them, uh, we have built the contracts to capture the upside of GMV from these, uh, from these provinces and from these private providers of, of, of cannabis. That being said, I think the, the bigger opportunity is that now that we have proven, uh, I think in Canada, but also globally, that we are uh, an ideal candidate for these type of uh, regulated industries, it means that as more countries think about their own uh, regulated industries, whether it's cannabis or, or otherwise, uh, we become sort of that, that first phone call, which is really important to us. So I think we've done a really good job in Canada, and we've proven that we can handle uh, all these different um, compliance issues, but also the particular needs of, of these regulated industries, and we hope that as other countries think about these industries, we're, we're, we're the people they look to. Um, so we're quite happy. And in terms of um, Q4, uh, we've sort of uh, baked in the expectations. But again, these are very early days, so there's nothing, uh, you know, we'll see how things roll out. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Your next question will come from Monica Garg from KeyBank. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. And you know, so yeah. this year, uh, this year, the key focus growth items, as Amy talked about, was, you know, plus and growing four big international markets like Germany, France, Japan, Hong Kong. Are there any key focus strategies for 2019? Thank you. Uh, it's too early to comment on 2019. We're in the, in the middle of our planning cycle, so um, more to come on uh, next quarter's call on that. Thanks, Monica. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Ross McMillan from RBC. Your line is open. Thanks so much, and congrats. Um, Harley, um, just on international, as you roll out these new areas of functionality like uh, local payments and um, local currency, uh, real-time present presentment, um, I think a lot of those functions are uh, plus initially, but I just wondered philosophically, how we should think about how those then get rolled out to kind of core uh, lower tier uh, uh, plus SKUs, uh, sorry, lower tier uh, Shopify SKUs and what the timing on that sort of uh, move down of that functionality might look like. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So I, I actually, I would say in, in some geographies, certainly uh, our, our entrance to the market seems to be larger merchants, um, but, but that is not, uh, that's not the case everywhere. Remember, in some of these places, we've had merchants, uh, we've had merchants in, in more than 150 countries for, for many, many years now. And so in some cases, there's pent up demand for us to better optimize our products so they can use our product in, in those countries. So whether it's local payment methods or it's apps that we have in our app store that are particularly uh, focused on that, that region and or it's, uh, for example, language support in, in the Shopify admin or even it's partners on the ground there. Um, in, in some cases, we, we know what we have to do there. It's just a matter of getting it done. That's why we've, we've prioritized it for 2018. Um, I would say that uh, across the board, uh, every country is very, very different. So we may start in one country with more of a plus push to try to get some of the larger merchants on and this way they can act as a bit of role models for some of the smaller merchants who eventually want to become them. Uh, but every country is, is sort of different, and, and we're sort of looking at each country in a, in, in, in a variety of different ways. I would say local payment methods, having great partners on the ground, uh, integrations with things like apps and also language are sort of the, the, the main things that we're focused on uh, right now, at least, for those main priority countries. Um, but we have a lot of opportunity there. Thank you. Your next question comes from Justin Furby from William Blair and Company. Your line is open. Thanks, guys. Um, I wanted to ask just quickly on dollar retention, just to how that's trending this year. It seems like one of the benefits of the model is just the ability to grow with your customers. But it seems like there's still opportunity here. I think based on your last disclosure, your, your annual dollar retention is somewhere under 100%. So I'm wondering if you can give us an update here um, and sort of how you think about the medium-term view on dollar retention and how that relates to, to scaling the model. Thanks. Um, dollar retention is an annual disclosure, so I, again, we'll be updating that next quarter. Thanks, Justin. Your next question comes from Richard C. from National Bank. Your line is open. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, you have a, a lot of growth drivers in front of you. I was wondering if you maybe just uh, you know, talk a little bit about the org structure and any sort of management changes uh, to sort of allow you effectively capture all those opportunities in front of you here going forward. Sure, <clears throat> Mr. Toby. Um, um, I mean, the team is obviously evolving. Amy's joined us. Um, uh, you know, Jeff joined us in marketing uh, recently. Uh, more importantly, I think, um, for um, taking advantage of opportunities we have is um, uh, within the last uh, 12 months, we, we reorganized the company around, um, we, we were a very um, functionally organized company, um, you know, with uh, engineering, design, and product reporting through different sort of um, uh, sides of the business up to me. And um, we have now organized around product lines that exists within the company. So plus is you know, very easy to understand one, which is sort of um, captures the totality of uh, uh, this particular space. And um, there's a general manager, um, and then um, the discipline support to them. So nothing earth shattering. It um, uh, was a move that we had to take to um, become more of a multi-threaded company um, because, uh, you know, like, um, these models tend to work really well. I think it's actually kind of uh, academically interesting that functional organizations worked so well for um, the company we had, um, even to the point that we had a couple of thousand people. And um, um, I think at the right time we um, turned it over. This kind of uh, model also allows, just ha has allowed for a lot of uh, new leadership positions within the company. Most of positions got filled internally. Um, and that's been very, very good for the, 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 the bench in the company um, for succession and all these kind of things. That's great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Darren Aftehi from Roth Capital Partners. Your line is open. Good morning. Uh, congratulations. Thanks for taking my question. Um, could I ask on uh, non-English speaking uh, GMV, can you just indulge us like what portion of your overall GMV is coming from that channel, and then as uh, as it relates to that, um, where like, the relative plus uh, penetration compared to kind of where the, the U.S. and Canadian markets launched uh, back when they were in early days, text. Yeah. Um, so on the uh, non-English speaking GMV, I can kind of try to um, comment at that. We don't uh, disclose the exact number, but I, I can tell you that uh, an er early indicator of uh, the progress that we're making internationally is um, is that GMV is a is a mix um, was the highest it's ever been uh, for Shopify in the third quarter. Um, so uh, it's early days, and this is going to play out <clears throat> over several years, but. Uh, the, the merchant growth internationally was strong in the quarter as well as the GMV mix, so we're, we're happy with our progress. On the uh, – it's Harley here. I'll take the sort of the plus GMV side of things. One thing to remember is that although a majority of the new uh, merchants on Shopify Plus uh, this quarter uh, were net new to Shopify, we still have a very, very healthy pipeline of, of upgrades, people that do really well, uh, start their business on Shopify, are sort of core merchants and upgrade. And so remember that as merchants become more successful, they gravitate to Shopify Plus, and so that GMV, of course, moves with them as well. Uh, that's a really important point because uh, when you're sort of thinking about GMV from Plus, obviously it's going to be bigger, but there also is an inherent and an organic graduation from core into plus over time uh, as merchants get successful, which is great. Great. Thanks, Thank Aaron. You. Next question comes from Samad Samana from Jeffries. Your line is open. Taking my question. Um, so it looks so, like um, you've added more Shopify Plus customers so far in 2018 than you did in all of 2017. I'm just wondering what's driving that acceleration in units. And then maybe just, Amy, what percentage of Plus customers are still on legacy pricing that need to get onto the, the new pricing? Thanks. 
Hey, Tarly, I'll take the first part of that question, uh, just in terms of where they're coming from. A couple things are, are happening. One, uh, there are a couple macro trends that are, have been really quite helpful to us. Uh, the direct-to-consumer movement is, is, is uh, as I said, on stage a couple days ago at Money 2020. It, it is not a fad. It is something that uh, is happening and, and will be steady state for a very long time. So we're seeing brands, uh, particularly like from some of the CPGs that never before went direct-to-consumer, that view Shopify as an incredible place to uh, to take those brands. I mean, I mentioned Lay's Potato Chips last quarter on the call. So we're seeing more of that. We're also seeing uh, a lot of these, um, you know, larger, uh, larger brands, established brands, looking to reevaluate their providers. Um, one is obviously a cost issue, but two, they want to be able to uh, be a little more nimble. And, and Shopify, uh, plus because it was forged in the fires of, of entrepreneurs, is a very uh, nimble way. And so, if a new channel uh, comes out, you know, the next day you're able to activate that channel with, with Shopify, and you can't necessarily do that with a lot of the larger enterprise uh, platforms. So we're seeing people replatforming. We're seeing uh, new direct-to-consumer brands that never sold direct to consumer before use Shopify to do that. We're also seeing increasing uh, partners that used to work with other uh, enterprise e-commerce platforms come over to us um, and, 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 and migrations are still happening as well. Uh, in addition to all of that, we still have those great upgrades. So as merchants are successful on Shopify, they upgrade to Shopify Plus as well. And so I wouldn't say there's any one particular channel that's driving it. I think it's all those different channels. Uh, and, and, and frankly, we're just we're just the best product if you're if you're a large scale uh, merchant and you need to have flexibility and you need to have uh, robustness in your in your platform. Uh, yeah, on the on the contracts, the large majority have have shifted over to the the new pricing. Uh, there still is a percentage um, that are on multi-year contracts that, that have not shifted over. And those, uh, while it's a small percentage, um, do represent some of our largest plus customers. So, um, so there's still, you know, headroom to go on that, um, on that platform uh, fee over time. Great, great. Thanks again for taking my questions. The next question comes from Nikhil Asadani from Mackey Research. Your line is open. Great. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, I was curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about your sort of process as it pertains to uh, cybersecurity, especially given that you have a lot more new products coming out. You're going in, in, into the busy Q4, and you're also sort of moving to a new uh, cloud backend. So how is your thinking with regards to cyber evolved, especially given that there seems to be some sort of bad news uh, almost out every single day? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is one of those advantages of um, maybe the Shopify being an, an engineer-run company. Um, this is, um, this was the, the current uh, coming of age uh, in uh, to um, security and um, uh, all these things were utterly predictable even a decade ago that that the internet would have this moment, um, and so. Uh, security is something that's very, very, very hard to retrofit on on any given product. Um, it, it, it's it's um, a lot better if you bake it in from this, this um, even the earliest assumptions of when the software is starting to be crafted. And, and, I, and luckily, um, uh, Shopify is on that side of the divide, so it's um, it, it's something that um, you know, like the people who run security are very high up in in, in this company. Um, some of the most trusted people. Um, it's part of every process. It is part of our general sort of internal operating system of how software is created. Um, Shopify is running, if not the largest one, definitely one of the largest uh, bug bounty programs that exists um, uh, out there. And um, so it, it just, I, like, I, I think um, Shopify's MO. Um, that existed for many years is now um, sort of emerging as the consensus best practice um, in, 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 in this world. And um, so I think, I think there we've, all, we've been in very good shape for a long time. And um, I think it's, um, uh, I mean, I, I, it goes without saying that, you know, we, we ask a lot of our um, uh, customers of our merchants, um, we, we we ask them to trust us with frankly their livelihoods. Um, that is a big ask, and um, uh, it comes with a, a great responsibility of uh, keeping data safe, keeping um, especially uh, observing the uh, privacy of all data involved, and all, like all these kind of things. This is some of these are things we take incredibly seriously, and uh, it would probably be surprising to a lot of people on, on the outside just how much time we spend internally discussing these things um, and trying to get everything just right. Great. Thanks, Nikhil. 
Your next question comes from Yal Arunian from Web Bush Securities. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. So I want to dig in on the marketing solutions a little bit. Um, you, you you rolled out the centralized dashboard, you know, uh, after third quarter, and um, you know I see marketing as a real natural extension of the merchant solutions uh, product offerings that you've, you've already put in place. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you see this contributing uh, to merchant solutions over time? Um, you know what 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 the pricing structure is like. Um, seems like a really important service uh, for merchants to me, um, you know, maybe as important as shipping would be. Uh, dig in a little bit on that. Yeah, I don't think we are, <coughs> we are, we are sharing the economics um, there, but I think um, you know, suffice to say that um, us helping our customers, like just even getting them thinking about the, in, in the right direction about how to, uh, you know, create traffic, how to uh, create awareness, those are the things which um, are incredibly valuable, just even from a from an obvious retention perspective. You know, like if um, uh, like e every time someone signs up for Shopify, this is essentially an exercise in searching for a product market fit. Um, and um, it's just when we look at a lot of the data at Shopify, we we, we find that it's usually the product that's there. It's it's it's, it's a market um, that could fit, but they don't find it. And so. Um, I mean, that's the obvious role from, uh, of marketing, and we have taken a um, um, do-it-yourself uh, position for a long time in the history of this business, um, just partly because um, the internet marketing world was just evolving at such a clip that, you know, like what you did one week was different from the next week and so on. Things are calming down a little bit. I, I, I mean, obviously, there's, um, you know, Facebook and AdWords are consensus uh, marketing platforms that... Um, products like Kit uh, have already successfully shown can be um, uh, packaged in a way that makes it simpler than the tools that those platforms tend to give people. Um, this, this simplicity is really important, again, for people in the um, uh, in sort of the entrepreneur uh, segment because they, they, they have so many new things to learn that if you can just say, hey, here's how you can allocate the dollars you sort of earmarked for marketing efficiently in the beginning, and get them a couple of sales of this, then this is uh, this is fantastic. So um, sometimes in these situations, there's possibilities for economics. That that really depends on on the channel. We, we um, build this in a platform first approach. So uh, this marketing section is going to be filled um, with uh, apps uh, that you can add to to your store. Some of them might be made by us. Many of them will not. Uh, and uh, so it's I think too early to project. I think I'm. I would think about it more um, in terms of revenue contribution, um, in in terms of um, subscription, like additional subscription um, income that we have by retaining the accounts and making more people successful, which of course our entire business model is um, built around um, partaking in the success of our merchants. Great, thanks. Great. thanks. Your next question comes from Gus Papangiorno from Macquarie. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Um, so in the quarter, 41% of uh, your GMV went through payments. But if you look at some of your more advanced markets, I mean, payments penetration is 90% plus. So I'm assuming the gating factors to getting to that kind of penetration rate for, for payments is uh, just rolling out more international markets and then just adoption uh, by plus customers. Can you talk about, you know, what you're doing to eliminate these gating factors? And over the long term, I mean, what do you think is a reasonable expectation for uh, the portion of your GMV going through payments? I mean, is 90% even possible? Or are there structural impediments that would prevent that? Hey there. Yeah, so in, in terms of the international stuff, obviously, as we roll out uh, more localized payment methods, that, that obviously helps with, with the penetration uh, in, in those countries. A couple of other things that, that is important to understand is there are some things that uh, that you need to have you need to be on Shopify payments in order to take advantage of. So things like Fraud Protect, for example, or Shopify Capital, for example. These are features that more and more of our merchants are asking for and, and, and they're finding a lot of success with. But of course, they're requ you're required to be on Shopify payments to use them. And so there are a couple ways that we can incentivize the adoption of Shopify, uh, Shopify payments. In terms of Shopify Plus, in general, Shopify Plus merchants uh, have more options because they have more uh, larger economies of scale and they have uh, larger negotiation uh, power with the with the actual credit card processors. Uh, and some of them even 
and come to Shopify with an existing integration. So what we're trying to do is we want Shopify payments just to be too good not to use. Uh, and, and so uh, by, by increasing the amount of products uh, around Shopify payments that require you to have Shopify payments, we think we can raise an adoption there. But that being said, you will always see a greater penetration of Shopify payments with our core merchants than you will with our Shopify Plus uh, merchants. Uh, great. great. So Thank just you, one clarification. Uh, is, is fraud protection, if you adopt payments, is fraud protection included in that, or do you still have to pay a fee? No, it's, it's, it's separate. Okay. Thank you. Your next question comes from Brian Essex from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, and thank you for taking the question. Maybe if, maybe if I can follow on that line of question around payments. Um, um, Amy, if you could help us understand the, the penetration rate of Shop Plus on payments, and as we look at some of the margin compression that we're seeing in the in the merchant solutions business, how much of that is mixed shift towards payments, and, and how much might we think about, like, to fine-tune our models going forward, how much is greater adoption of, you know, lower margin business? I'm not sure if, you know, Shopify plus given the add-ons would be lower margin or not at this point, but maybe if you can give us a little bit of color there, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we, we don't talk specifically about the payments uh, uh, penetration rate, uh, but I, I can tell you with respect to merchant solutions margins in, in the quarter, uh, we did see a, a, a sequential decline. Uh, it was not due to payment margins um, themselves. That was similar quarter over quarter. This quarter, um, the margin decline was uh, purely driven by a mix. Payments was just a larger mix of merchant solutions in this quarter. Great. Thank you, Brian. Next question, please. Yes, your next question comes from Thomas Forte from DA Davidson. Your line is open. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Wanted to talk about the entrepreneur space. I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, why was LA chosen as the first location over another city such as San Francisco and Toronto? And then how should we think about your plans to potentially expand the initiative to other cities in the future? Yeah, in terms of expansion, uh, we're, we're still uh, evaluating uh, where we're going to go if we're going to go uh, anywhere after after this. It, it really is just trying to understand what that looks like. Can we get more people into the store that never heard of a Shopify and get them to build stores? Can we make existing merchants even more successful? So uh, the reason LA was selected is just because of concentration of merchants uh, in, in, a, in a very small area there. Uh, some of our some of our uh, most successful merchants have also come out of Los Angeles, so it's just it, it just seemed like it was a hotbed for us to uh, and a natural place for us to open up shop. But in terms of where we're going to go next. We're, we're just going to learn about what works, what doesn't, uh, and, and kind of test a bunch of things out. We like the idea, though, of, of having a space. Entrepreneurship, as, as many of you know, is, is, is can be quite lonely, and, and the fact that entrepreneurs, and, and frankly, more importantly, aspiring entrepreneurs, can have a place where they can have peers and they can have other people going through the same thing they're going through, we think is really great. And when you add to that, that we can do all this type of education, whether it's you know product photography, or help them writing product descriptions, or understanding how to drive more traffic to their online store, um, all these things are things we can do in physical space really easily. Um, but it's uh, LA will be the first one. We'll see where it goes from there. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from Brian Peterson from Raymond James. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for taking the question. So, so just wanted to hit on the sales and marketing line. Uh, that was a little better than expected for me this quarter. And Harley, I believe you used the word deliberate when talking about international investments. I'm curious, as you look at the international opportunity, does that potentially scale back some of the investments that you would have made domestically, or is that simply a comment on international and looking to balance LTV to CAC as you enter new geographies? Um, I, I can I can take that one. Um, let me just talk generally about about sales and marketing. Um, and, and kind of where we're investing. I mean, we're continuing to invest um, in our core geographies, but, but we are um, increasing our investment uh, investments in PLOS, both sales and marketing, and then international uh, marketing as well. Uh, we're also uh, beginning to invest in some brand marketing. And so um, our sales and marketing um, was a, a little bit lower, I believe, for, as a percentage of revenue this quarter, but still, you know, growing um, pretty comparable, uh, just a hair below revenue growth um, as we see those opportunities to invest for for current and future growth. And it, some of that spend, um, international and, and brand spend, has a longer-term uh, return on investment. 
and you know some of it is um, is learning, uh, and it may take some time before we find um, those efficient channels uh, in some geographies um, in newer geographies. So. Um, so it's an area of investment for us right now. Um, we're starting to see it pay off, and uh, we expect it to continue to pay off into the future. Great. Thanks, Brian. Your next question comes from David Hines from Canaccord. Your line is open. Hey, <clears throat> thanks. Good morning, guys. So you, you addressed a couple issues uh, impacting MRR growth, um, but as we see a bit of a deceleration there, you know, we're, we're starting to field some questions around you know, the quality of merchant ads as you kind of solve for the long tail and what the implications are on churn. So I, I guess my question is, is there a GMV threshold at which you see a material inflection in, in merchant retention? You know, what, what is that number? And is there any way to kind of frame what percent of the merchant base is kind of above that threshold today? You know, the, the stickier segment of the uh, uh, of, of your customer base? Yeah, um, yeah, that exists. Um, um, uh, we don't share... Um, New numbers often on this course, but I think this is one I can give away. That threshold is one dollar GMV. The moment someone sells something, the account is really sticky. So, therefore, we have a lot of efforts on trying to just help people get um, get to that first sale. It's uh, something uh, that happens every minute on Shopify that someone has their first sale, and I, I think this is one of those facts that um, you know maybe it doesn't look great in spreadsheets, but it's certainly the kind of thing that uh, everyone at Shopify here is very proud of um, because this is sort of what we um, gather around. This is sort of part of, I mean, this, this is the reason why this company exists, right? Helping people, um, um, re helping people in their own sort of reach for independence um, and be successful um, uh, in on-bound for your journey. So, um, yeah, and our analysis is always the same. It's if you get someone to do a sale, if that sale isn't from the same zip code that they live in, which usually means that mom bought something, then um, <laughs> uh, then it's uh, it, it, it's it's usually the beginning of a successful journey, and uh, we, we we build around that. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Your next question comes from Kevin Krishnaratni from Baradam Capital. Your line is open. Hey there, good morning. You've uh, noted a couple times on the call that, that merchant ads in Q3 were uh, better than Q2, uh, and, and I know, understand that international is driving that, but can you talk about what the underlying trends have been in North America the past couple quarters? Thanks. Um, you know, I, I think generally uh, because most of the, the merchants still are um, our, our core geographies, um, the, the general trends speak for the North American trends. Great. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Your next question comes from Deepak Mathevenen from Barclays. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question. Uh, Facebook has become more aggressive recently in tightening their advertising solutions. We've heard that from some of our checks in this space. Has that affected any marketing capabilities that you provide, you know, from your platform directly and indirectly? Are you hearing anything from your merchants about their demand generation success uh, through Facebook? Thank you. I, we, do, we do hear, I mean, this is something we talk a lot with people about. Um, again, advertising products that people want to an audience that sort of is generally interested in this area is the most above board advertising that exists right like it's it's this is um like if if um the users of facebook could um uh determine that that's the only advertising kind of advertising they'll ever see then they would very gladly share their interests right like i mean i i, I like technology and i like skateboarding so i like uh, electric skateboards right this is the kind of thing that the platform is fantastic at. Um, so, uh, like retailers are not hit by the changes and tightening of the advertising platform. It's people who are trying to change your opinion on core matters, <laughs> but specifically politically. Most, most hopefully, um, I, in my personal opinion, should be um, negatively impacted by the changes. And um, uh, I, retail is not really much of. Um, uh, it's not like fa Facebook wants more retail marketing because that's easy um, and okay with everyone. So um, 
in terms of success rates, uh, um, customer acquisition costs outside of some areas just getting more and more competitive with more and more players. Um, it's uh, we don't hear anything about uh, structural changes, and even that is tends to be um, offset by um, you know more advertising opportunities coming online. Like we we have some customers who are quite successful advertising on stories, and uh, you know these kind of new um, app formats that exist. And um, so there's uh, this is just uh, everything is very nominal in that space. Great. Thanks, Deepak. Your next question comes from Todd Copeland from CIBC. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Given the upside in uh, local uh, payments in Germany, what uh, should be the rhythm, what rhythm should we expect in the other other uh, markets in terms of your local payments plans? Give us an idea on what to expect there. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, as we uh, as we see different markets grow, and we see that there is uh, an opportunity for us to work with uh, to get a local payment method set up there, we're going to of course do that. We started with Germany uh, because uh, we have a lot of merchants there, and uh, it was, as you know, it's one of our priority uh, expansion countries for, for for this year, and so it was just an obvious fit. Uh, but we have teams that are looking at uh, what are the next ones to, to go after. I think over time you'll see more and more local payment methods roll out, uh, particularly into priority geographies, uh, and uh, and we're going to hit the ones uh, fastest that uh, that the one, that, that are easiest to get into uh, where we have the most pent-up demand. Great. Thanks, Todd. Your next question comes from Koji Aikida from Oppenheimer. Your line is open. open. Oh, great. Uh, congrats on the quarter, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to touch on the uh, B2B e-commerce opportunity. Any sort of color on, on what sort of trends or maybe unexpected positives or even challenges uh, that you saw during the quarter with your B2B e-commerce offering would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, B2B and the wholesale offering, uh, you know, continues to, to roll out. Uh, you know, we're now offering advanced pricing capabilities, customer-specific pricing as well, um, and new integrations with things like Shopify Flow to automate some of that, uh, some of that work. Uh, I said this on the last call, but it's worth it, it bears repeating, which is that B2B is going to be really, really important to the merchants that require it, but most merchants are not going to require B2B capabilities. What it does do for us, though, is it does expand our, our total gross market with Shopify Plus because there was just some merchants that didn't think about us previously because we really were more of a direct-to-the-end consumer type of model and, and business. And now, obviously, we're able to have a sales team and, and, and particular Shopify Plus partners who are focused more on that B2B wholesale space. So I don't think the B2B product is going to be used by uh, – all of our Shopify Plus merchants, uh, but for those that, that do need it, it is really, really helpful. And, and again, that, that product needs to evolve and get better over time. And I think it's worth um, saying that um, uh, a lot of manufacturers, um, uh, you know, B2B is all they do um, right now. That is, is sort of the MO of that industry um, and has been. And then Harley talks um, a lot about direct-to-consumer. Again, this in every boardroom and every one of our companies, people are thinking about how, how we're going to start like a direct relationship with our customers because, you know, for all sorts of structural reasons, it's 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 uh, tough going to have people sit between you and your customers. And so um, adopting Shopify Plus just for the B2B product is usually an improvement on what uh, what we've been doing, and this allows the capability, this allows the optionality of a single click, now I'm going to have a website afterwards. And it just kind of speaks to this like, land and expand thing that's going on because, again, after they then have a wholesale channel, they might think, you know, maybe we test the waters on Instagram marketing. That seems like a little bit of a leap from B2B, but, you know, some people might go this way out, and all of that is possible once you have the Shopify platform um, implemented, and those are things that are just completely out of the reach of most retailers if you don't. Great. Thanks, Koji. Your next question will come from Mark Zuckowitz from Rosenblatt Securities. Your line is open. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, getting back to the uh, comment on sticky merchants, uh, I'm curious if that's more of a function of the onboarding of the right merchant, you know, meaning that your customer acquisition strategy versus uh, support of that merchant once it's onboarded. And if you could also speak to any learnings that you've gained on that front. And uh, the 
you know, over, you know, roughly the last 12 to 18 months and sort of what the attrition rate trend line has looked like uh, more recently. Thanks. So maybe cl clarify if I'm not heading off here in the right direction um, um, for your for your question, but I think what you're you're wondering is um, how we determine that we get the like, on, on what the right customers. Um, does that make is that sort of what you're asking for? Yeah, I was just thinking about your customer acquisition strategy and sort of how it's um, matured over the last. Uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, and you know how much a uh, you know maybe modifications you made within that acquisition strategy have led to a you know maybe a better prospect or you know a more sticky merchant, uh, and you know sort of comparing that to you know once you you've onboarded uh, you know a prospect uh, in sort of your your support in terms of you know, retaining that customer. So I guess, you know, two separate variables there. Yeah, and, and this gets in, in – it gets – it becomes a tricky conversation, right, because there's two separate things happening here. Um, one is um, um, to if, if, if we wanted – if we set a company goal to get more sticky customers or more converting customers, like – the problem is that's an average. One, one, only thing Shopify really wants to do in, when it thinks about its funnel is it wants to get all the people into the product because like provisioning a new Shopify account costs nothing. It's the same. Like if someone adds a new product to the database or we add a new shop to the database, it's exactly the same cost to us, right? So um, marginal cost is nothing. So we want people signing up for Shopify accounts to um, everyone who has that kind of ambition to um, – you know, reach for independence, as I said earlier, um, to 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 give this a go, and we want that to be as wide as possible. Um, people come in from all sorts of. Sometimes it's like a high school uh, class which set themselves a project to sell the cookies and stuff like this. It's it's like um, so thinking about getting some kind of average up doesn't really make sense because we want we really want to get as many people who have a chance at getting their first sale to someone they don't know. Because then what happens after we get people to that point is um, even if that wasn't a business that they are willing to go all in on um, and, uh, and and build into something, they've caught the bug. <laughs> they, they're, they're going to be back. They, they are going to – because it demystified the process of starting a business, which is a really, really cool skill to acquire. And um, uh, so th this is why we are thinking about – this is why I tend to, to – um, discourage averages in general because this is such a fast-growing company and um, there are so many components of this business um, that uh, um, when, when you try to take an average, it, it, you just get uh, you get the wrong picture because they like very often um, things that look bad for averages are actually really good for gross profit dollars, which is the thing we actually care about. And, and um, I think that's. Like uh, that's sort of a brain dump on on that topic for me. Hope that's helpful. Right. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right. Uh, thanks everybody for dialing in this morning, and have a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect.